Hello SGD, uh, this will be part four in the series uh, on the Aswan quarry, but we're looking going a little bit broader because it's about the issue of transportations of stone. So uh, Egypt is the Nile. Nile Valley, just Egypt is the Nile, that's it. Without it, there was nothing. Um, the And you can sort of divide, so there was Upper Egypt is Southern Egypt, and then we have, okay, that's not really important. But basically, you can divide Egypt into three groups. So what there is, there's a layer of sand, limestone. Underneath, there's a layer of sandstone, and underneath that, there's a layer of granite. Uh, the lime, so the northern part of Egypt is limestone. That's why all the pyramids, etc., are built from limestone. That's the local material. You go down a bit south, the limestone layer has been... Um, eroded away and we have uh, sandstone and you'll see a concentration of sandstone buildings there and for granite you, you need to go south now this is a r rough rule because for instance up in Cairo not far from Cairo there is a, a granite quarry there are alabaster quarries there are all sorts of little pockets of stone here and there different ones but basically it's limestone in the north sandstone in the middle and if you want granite, you have to travel down south. And again, there are other pockets, for instance, near Cairo, some granite, but generally all the granite comes way down south, uh, 800 um, kilometers or 500 miles away as the crow flies from the Great Pyramids. Okay, so we have Giza or Cairo, where the, the Great Pyramids are, Thebes, uh, where the Luxor and Karnak Temple is, Valley of the Kings, that type of thing. And down south we have Aswan, uh, which is the famous Aswan quarry. Okay, so now the key to this is the flood. Let's skip forward one more. So when they built the high Aswan dam, uh, it was completed in the 70s, that basically changed the, the landscape of Egypt forever. It's, it's all the way back, as far as you can go, we had three seasons. Uh, Egyptians had three seasons. They had the flood season, then the season of growth, and then the harvest season. That's well, okay. That's sort of Egypt, Egyptology 101. That was the way things were. Uh, first smaller dam was completed about 1901, but we still had some sort of flood activity. But at least from from the 70s, Egypt, what it is now compared to what it's been throughout its existence, very different. Uh, if you go back to the Old Kingdom period, you now this map you see it's all deserty and yellow. Uh, in the Old Kingdom, this was much greener. Uh, they were basically, around the time of Unas and Pepi and the pyramid texts and the last of those pyramids, uh, there was a 20-year period of, of drought. The, the flood didn't happen. The flood is essential because it not only brings water, but it also brings uh, mud, sediment, and that gets deposited on on the banks that's the key to their agriculture so it's not just the irrigation of the flood it's also the soil that it brings with it from the um, Ethiopian highlands but, uh, but back in the day before the high Aswan dam you can see how the flood you know uh, and this is probably not even a particularly high the highest one but it reaches right up to the base of the pyramids now the river is five kilometers from the pyramids but this is a way that for one third of a year that's what it looked like um Klossi of memnon on the west bank and here we see a picture of karnak on the east bank there at thebes and you can see even the floods in pardon me receding you can see how high it goes by the watermarks you can even if you look now the columns out of there you can see how the plaster has been removed because of the flood. Um, that was the, ho the, the high level of the flood. Uh, Karnak, for instance, had a mud brick wall all around it. That was a flood protection, and we'll, that will be for the next episode. But this is what Egypt used to be. And then we come down to Aswan and the unfinished obelisk. Okay, so that's where the granite come from. Now, how high did the flood used to be? Interesting uh, book. I put the links in the description, of course, for Nile Notes for Travellers by uh, um, Wallace Budge, published 1895. 
the land about elephant elephantine and Thebes has been the usual rise of a flood at Cairo is 25 feet at Thebes 38 feet and Aswan 45 feet now because Aswan is much closer to the source of a river the flood was higher back in the day they captured as much water as they could and so there was even uh, water loss because of deliberate irrigation um, happening and again at Aswan you can see the river's much narrower and then it broadens as it gets down to Giza as well so that's why the flood level is different at different areas now 25 feet or 7.6 meters okay this is Nilos the Roman god of the Nile uh, generally believe that the 16 nymphs that are around there are associated with the 16 cubit height of the Nile flood the Romans treasured Egypt because it provided so it basically fed the, the, the grain coming out of Egypt from the Nile was one of the main food it fed the empire essentially not quite but it was huge importance and at 16 cubits that's approximately 8.5 meters so you can see 7.6 meters back in 1895 why 8.3 well not a huge difference but we'll, we'll come to that because in antiquity versus 1895 and the flood levels well that's an interesting thing to look at we'll come to that in a moment so there's a pitch so we have uh, elephantine island there's a nilometer there I'm like, you know, if you want to look up nilometer photos and stuff you can see they were all very important again right up to the time that they were building uh, they built the dams the um in ancient times they would use a nilometer to pre to set tax so if the water level was too low there'd be less food to grow less taxes for water levels too high it would also ruin uh, there'd be less harvest because it would ruin the crops wash away um you know, orchards and that type of stuff so there was a they were looking for the nice level of the flood uh this is just and Aswan essentially is the southern but it's where Egypt starts because just a little bit off the map here are the first cataracts white water so you couldn't sail you know you'd have to drag your boat around in there uh basically from Aswan all the way to to the delta and Cairo uh it's clear sailing it's a beautiful it's in this in that essence it's a perfect river because you don't have uh boats can travel easily across there there are no uh, rapids no waterfalls that type of things so that's another important element now why have I got all these uh, place marks I'll show you in a moment okay so firstly in the blue box there that is the quarry where the unfinished obelisk is so that's the unfinished obelisk this little tiny little speck of land is not the, the, the source of all granite that's just the preserved part of the of one of the ancient quarries so there's the unfinished obelisk and what we have there is the harbor here are some because the google earth picture it looks rather dry here are some great pictures from the azita project where you can see uh how it's waterlogged there now that's not stone underneath there there's soil uh, I'll put the links in the description to the paper canal extensions confirmed by geophysical surveys as one obelisk quarry and several obelisks were removed from here but the point is that this was the harbour and there's even paint the only part in the quarry here where they have pictures of uh, fish and so forth as well and well what do I mean by that so first let's you can go on the google earth and get the elevations the unfinished obelisk is 107 108 meters above sea level and this harbor here is 100 meters above sea level all right so i've just got the arrow pointing to the harbor 100 meters above sea level the river elevation is um, 85 or 86 meters at the bank okay we mentioned earlier so at Aswan, the flood level, recorded in 1895, uh, that period well, essentially was 45 feet or 13.7 metres. And so with those place markers, I just went across, I found the elevation and marked it. So all of that in blue is 99 metres and below. So that's that 13.7 metres from the river. So in 1895, all of this would have been underwater. Again, 
that's not the only part. I just focused on the part right next to the unfinished obelisk. So a lot more would have been uh, inundated, flooded over, and that's only at 99 metres. And the elevation of the harbour is 100 metres. It's right on that now. Uh, there's a cemetery right there. And in the paper, uh, they mentioned the shopkeeper indicated that his grandfather often said that an island existed within the cemetery during the annual flood. Uh, flood level, if an island did exist, winter uh, flood water would have flowed northeast within the swale that extends along Mubarak Street. I don't think it's called that anymore. Immediately adjacent to the quarry within the vicinity of Line T5. From that paper, there's a map. There's Line T5. So there's the unfinished obelisk. Here's the harbour. And you can see, I'm we'll just follow that rock path around. So those areas were in flood. Now, okay, now the next one. So back to uh, what um, Budge has to say. If statements made by ancient writers be compared, it will be seen that the actual height of the inundation is the same now as it always was and that it maintains the same proportion with the land it irrigates according to Wilkinson. So the cubic measures of the nilometers ought after certain periods be raised proportionally if we wish to arrive at the great accuracy in the measurement of the waters. The level of the land which always keeps pace with that of a river increases at the rate of six inches in a hundred years in some places and in others less. The land has been steadily rising as the flood delivers soil and lifts up the land. And they will catch, they will out, going out of their way to catch that soil. The proof of this is at the highest scale in the Nileometer at the island of Elephantine, which served to measure the inundation in the reigns of the early Roman emperors, is now far below the level of the ordinary High Nile and the obelisk of Heliopolis, the Colossi of Thebes, and other similarly situated um, monuments are now washed by the waters of the inundation and embedded to a certain height in a stratum of alluvial soil which has been deposited around their base. Then again, the land, and he gives the height of the floods. But uh, this had never really occurred to me before. Uh, the land there is rising because of this constant deposit of sediments used for the key uh, for their agriculture as well so if you we go back to that map and I set it at 99 meters well modern building activity and the rising land and he's again he's saying um, proposing that the land in the last uh, sorry yeah, I didn't read that part the land about Elephantine and at Thebes has been raised about nine feet in 1700 years so that's uh, going back to 400 AD and of course these places extend further back um, I'm just quoting there now there might be the numbers might be a little bit wrong or, or quite a bit wrong but the essence of it remains that the land has been raising, um, rising and that's why there's been need to repair adjust the Nileometers also interesting the wrote uh, he says here that the statues of the Nile God are painted green and red Colours are supposed to represent one, the colour of the river in June, green, and is a bright green before the inundation, and then the ruddy or the red hue with its waters as the red mud is brought down from the Abyssinian mountains. So that flood, not just for water, for, the, for agriculture and everything, water is life. Again, that red water, the mud, sediment, uh, nutrients were constantly recharging the soil, otherwise it would just there would be there would be no Egypt so the light blue areas are where it's just one or two meters above that 99 meter level the again even the and that description of the cemetery being an island so I'm being even here I'm being conservative with the numbers uh, and the rising but so where the unfinished obelisk is and you just can out it's you you don't even have to take it the one and a half kilometers from the quarry to the river uh, it's right there you just put the blocks on the boat so before we go into raising obelisks and, and massive weights so okay I think I've got the pictures of it so here's the unfinished obelisk 
it's but that's its location now remember, all this is granite so if you you can see these natural you know canals channels going through there so all of those uh blocks whether it's Serapium, uh cafe valley temple the siren they didn't all come from that little speck there was a tiny little speck all this is granite and you have red granite gray granites um black granite quartzite which is quarried on the other side of the river here and so yeah you know once the you can see the lower part of the dam and that's the high uh, as one high dam there and then they have lake nasser extending behind there but even just by the topography as it is there you can see how there's so much opportunity to sail along the river it's all granite there oh, there's a nice big block it's right next to the river let's pluck it um or you have a more and more of an established quarry okay we're going to be here for a while let's dig a, a canal and and just have the, the the river come right to us rather than have to drag the stones to the river so you'll often hear often get the question well how did they transport for instance the, the serapium coffers or the big granite blocks at the cafe valley temple or the uh, 80 ton granite which is in the great pyramid how did they transport this 500 miles or 800 kilometers well they didn't transport it 500 miles or 800 kilometers think of it this way i walk see there's aswan airport i walk onto a plane here and then the plane flies me to cairo airport and i walk off did i walk 800 kilometers no i just walked a short distance onto the plane and i walked a short distance off you wouldn't you know if i boasted that you'd you'd laugh at me naturally well that's the the same principle goes here and that's why the lost ancient high technology community is always posing this like how did how did they do this how did they do this apparently they run tours they'll take your money they'll sell you the books but they won't answer these questions apparently you know like these are the expert researchers who have been at it for years you know like uh, uh, copper chisels copper chisels type of guys all right so how did they transport it well they, the river did it now I'll post this paper in here uh, i've got there are better bit so that's an illustration of um hepshetsut's barge where they moved two mighty obelisks from aswan down to karnak and unas uh again I'll, you can even see that they've got the palm frond uh, the the large single piece columns um that are often you'll see those in their mortuary temples and so forth uh, other places also being transported on a barge they had big ships don't let anyone fool you other uh, tell you otherwise you know because there was one clip where they made a small boat in the egyptian style where the boat maker had to completely relearn his craft he'd never made a boat in the old style so he made a small boat and they had a problem moving a one or a two ton block and it's oh well that's proof look proves it it proved nothing it uh it proves that they're uh, obsessed with this idea and we'll look at the other old old kingdom depictions of their boats are much larger than that dinky little boat that they made for that experiment great experiment because it was not the size of a boat it was the technique of you know they didn't use nails they didn't build boats the modern way their boats were built more like uh, viking ships where they would be lashed together so that experiment was awesome experiment but it gets misrepresented in like oh, this, this proves they couldn't have moved no absolute nonsense egyptians had bigger boats and uh they the, the, we've got the receipts in in that uh sense as well again there are a lot better pictures of um Hatshepsut's barge uh, the ones that i found have got that uh 123 rf or whatever all over it i'll get some more but this paper goes into even medieval examples of how did they move columns and well with boats it's the best way to do it so the megalithic stones only ever needed to be moved a mile or, or two at both so uh, at best so for instance the granite uh which is in the free geyser pyramids for instance uh, when the flood rose that you've only got to bring it that distance there short distance from the quarry to the boat then the boat brings it to the uh now even is it uh 
think that would be where's the okay that appears to be the sphinx's head that's the cafe valley valley temple which isn't even has a harbor a reception point where the flood this is not the high point of a flood the uh, water could have come up here and also during that time the rising of the land and uh, other activity changing that but we for instance at the cafe valley temple there's a boat harbor right there uh, the causeway that comes off the Great Pyramid basically it comes down here and right and get the, the stone was just delivered right next to there. So the megalith, like how did they move a megalith? It's, it's a thousand, how did you do a thousand kilometers? No, they moved it a mile or two at most. The other 498 miles of river current did all the work. I, I didn't walk from Aswan Airport to Cairo Airport. I flew there. I only walked and onto the plane and got off again so if you get this question and you've seen this is a this is a not uh for these expert like people who are charging tour money writing books send me money buy my merch this is <laughs> all right so uh the serapium right next to the river uh we'll go into more examples but just wanted to get this idea of the flood in there uh we'll be looking at examples of recent ones before modern advanced crane technology how they moved some of the largest stones ever moved in history it was done with rope and wood and basic sailing techniques because all rigging and lifting comes from ship rigging that's where rigging and lifting industry okay all uh, right so examples now even here's some photos of cleopatra's uh, needle in new york city um how to raise obelisk because I'll, I'll mention the unfinished obelisk and just like the pregnant mother stone in Baalbek still attached to the earth never moved those don't need to be explained the only things that need to be explained are the mighty statues uh, obelisks and so forth that have been moved and we'll look at examples there'll be more to come but in some cases such as the Hepshetsut and Tutmosis obelisks in Karnak that temple is right next to the river they build a big mud brick wall around it to protect it from the flood because it's right on the riverbank and that thing that the mud brick wall the, the wall surrounding those temples and and others as you'll see for instance here at uh oh what's it name now I forget the name eludes me now just south of Aswan oh god I can't believe I can't remember it. Just uh, not Elephantine. Anyway, but, but the their large columns could have been floated in. So it's not even f bring it from the quarry, then take it a short distance across the land. In some cases, some of those temples, you could float the big stones and the big columns in and the statues now i'll also go into the colossi of Mem memnon because it's 600 tons they're right at the top of the of the heavy stones that were actually moved but uh, more to come that'll be in the next part but uh, the key point is that we go back to the topography of there the, the, it's the canal systems those papers will be linked as well that was how they moved stones. They moved them very short distance, very, very short distance, floated them down, and then they moved them a very short distance to their you know, final destination, as in, such as the pyramids or the Serapium or the Ramesseum, uh, Siron and uh, Heliopolis obelisks and that type of thing as well. So it is an awesome effort. Let's, you know, but the level of you know the mystery the, like, like how 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 um why do they never mention the flood why do they never talk about that uh i think that's a very very important point because they're selling the mystery but like surely again they've been researching it for years and years they've been uh, hundreds of thousands if uh, just in um yusuf iowan's tour company has gone through that business and well, why do they not, you know, talk about this? You know, it's just the same old thing over and over. It's precision, it's precision, which it isn't. It's impossible. Ah, oh, but the wood would crash. Oh, the wood would crash. All the ropes are not strong enough. All this is 
absurd nonsense uh, you know the, the ropes breaking not being strong enough or the wood being crushed i i've seen it and dealt with these but like i'm a you know i've i have six degrees and worked in the best companies and I, it's not true it can't be done this would happen nonsense uh, not all but there are deliberate trolls who go around and keep feeding this information in there uh, the new one is of course that oh you're straw manning the lost high technology guys i never said that that's like the new fashion but i've been through it all i've done it all um they never come back um because it's it's yeah it's rubbish but the egyptologists you know this cunning bunch which hide you know all they're hiding all this information well it's freely available um type of stuff and yeah so they weren't stupid they were very clever work smart not hard and even things yeah again this is like for these you know uh, copper chisels merch and all this other stuff going um on there it's it's a business why don't they they're evil uh like lazy or lying about have uh, have done that they've done the research or they have done it and they know and they don't present that information because it it ruins the business that's why I, and also i, I uh, it's like a cult it really is because you look at the behavior uh, if you go against the grain, you know you, you don't follow their narrative. You're tossed. At, you're a. Uh, you know you're you're evil. You've left a religion. How dare you? It's like and, and that's how these cults operate. If you don't go with the dogma, if you present information that disrupts the mystery, oh, you're out the door. And so, yeah. Uh, you know, who am I? I'm just a dude from you know f from the suburbs. You know, I'm not I'm not making I'm not, this this costs me money to do this. I'm not making a cent. I'm losing money here, and yet I'm able to you know do these and look at these. But I have again, I've been researching this for twenty years, and well, you've wasted twenty years, buddy. <laughs> that's what that's it. You know what I mean? Like. Uh, you see, you'll see, but but the the tide is changing. You know this this old and that you know this lost civilization thing. It's not working out so well because you know, more uh, people aren't being bullied as as much as they used to be. Uh, the more of this type of information, other channels now are like presenting the, this information and not being bullied out of it, and it's it's crumbling. It's that's what it is. So there are solutions and not only there are theoretical solutions the evidence for this is written in stone for instance here at the quarries the obelisks which they will tell you were impossible lost ancient high technology such as Hepshetsut and Tutmosis they left inscriptions there at the quarries not only saying that we built the canal they've you know like, <laughs> that we have the receipts on these things it's not just you not know, you know I don't trust the inscriptions because every inscription even the beautiful ones which apparently is also lost high technology are in egyptian naming egyptian people hapshetsut even says it took her seven months to uh construct these we have the receipts and again this 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 narrative is is crumbling and there are a lot more egyptologists than just zawi hawas that's another like oh, zawi hawas zawi hawas anyway uh more to come we'll be looking at again the egyptian their receipts for these types of things and examples where with primitive ancient technology where whether it's a uh uh is it palais de la concorde in paris or the the largest obelisks are in rome they were transported across the mediterranean and uh and then re roman technology was re used to move and lift the obelisks again and even in, so you'll see oh well these this is these are fake photos this is rubbish photos these are, these, these photos are bs the, the attitude to that is bs because it's a cult in that sense because we even have photographs of people we have film of people 
moving massive, lifting massive um, objects and stuff. Uh, specs on what the on at what point wood crushes and wood snaps freely available. Uh, this, what's the fiber? The strength of uh, hemp fibers and other fibers for the rope freely available. So don't let it. If anyone tells you no, the wood would break or the wood uh, or the rope would snap. Nonsense. Abs like they're bullshitting to you when when they say that. Especially if they come from. Well, I'm an expert in this field. No, they're bullshitters. Uh, if they were an expert, they would have access to that type of database and would know how to look it up. Like any you know diligent engineer uh, would. And so when someone tells you otherwise, they are lying to you. Um, but it, there's trolls out there who are just keep dropping the same misinformation over and over and over again. And uh, even when you present the, the links, the data, well, then they go away and then I'll appear on someone else's channel, looking at you, Corey, uh, saying the same sorts of uh, things again. Because, yeah, uh, it's, it's, that's it more to come we'll go into more detail into these other features as well and so that's it have a good one